Welcome back to the Resilience Pod. You're here with me, your host, Rena Singh. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Whether you are watching or listening, I am truly grateful. Now, today on the Resilience Pod, we have our next guest who is sat right next to me. She is responsible for three million um, members of the public. Yes, that's right. That includes me and you guys for ensuring the safety and making sure we're safe from threats and hazards. That's a big job. Along with that, she's also responsible for ensuring her team, so that's approximately probably over 10,000 people, are able to effectively respond in a major incident or crisis. Wow, what a huge job that is. So with that, it brings a vast amount of challenges. And not only that, she also prides herself in being the first in her industry to accomplish many things, such as creating a national Ebola guidance and many more things that she has done. She is truly an amazing leader in the resilience industry in her field and if you haven't guessed it already we are talking about the industry one of the largest metropolitan policing forces in the country outside of london guys so please join me in welcoming my very next guest on the pod kirsty Bowman. hi welcome. hi hi <laughs> welcome to the resilience pod how are you today i'm very good Good, thank you for coming all the way. Um, we are really excited to have you and get your opinion on what it is like to work in the policing sector because yep. we've never really had that before. And as civilians, it will be really interesting because it's a thankless job that you do. And we are excited to, excited to kind of get into the, the nitty gritties, not only of that, but about you as yep. well yep, and your challenges. That. So. Um, as always, before we get off into the interviews, um, Kirsty is going to tell us how she is feeling. So she's got the mood book in front of her and she's going to flick through it and tell us um, what she's feeling. Okay. Right then. Okay. I've picked one. Okay. Can we see that? Yeah, we yeah. can. And just tell our audience who are listening what it is that you're feeling. So I've, I've chosen contemplative for this morning. Okay, and why are you feeling contemplative? Um, I think one of the aspects of coming on to the Resilience Pod is that it does make you think. Um, mm -hmm. It's made me think about my journey, it's made me think about my challenges, it's made me think about um, how I can potentially offer some you know, guidance mm -hmm. and reflections of my experience that can help somebody else. Great. So yeah, that made me contemplate on everything. Great, thank you. So Kirsty is feeling contemplative. We will ask her at the end how she is feeling. Um, and so do stay tuned for that. Now, time for the quizzing of the question. Okay, so Kirsty, how, um, well, what, where, where did it all start? What was your very first job? So my first paid job was working in a library. Okay. <laughs> um, so naturally got me interested in books, love reading and um, love the quiet space that it gave you. Mm -hmm. um, but I started to move into the resilience industry quite naturally um, when I first of all wanted to learn to fly. Oh wow, <laughs> did you? Yeah, I did, okay. yeah, yeah. And had it not have been for my arm limbs um, not being a little shorter than they should have been, oh. maybe that would have been the case. But um, my career took a different turn and um, that connection to kind of the public services made me move into um, uniform public services mm -hmm. um, as a college course already done my A-levels by that point yeah. um, and then that's when I got into major instant work, multi-agency working, public sector work. Um, I really enjoyed it. Okay. Really, really loved it. Loved it. So somebody said to me, Kirst, you know you can study this at university. <laughs> I was like, no, I didn't know you could study at university. Um, so I had a look at it and I applied. Unfortunately, I, I was too late to go in for the normal application process. Okay. So it was the phone call through clearing that people hear about yes, sometimes. Phone to clearing and um, through some tough conversations and selling yourself mm -hmm. and why you really, really want to do it. Um, I got on there and um, studied at a university and I, I don't know, I just, I think I just found 
what I wanted to do. Wow. It was amazing. I loved it. So that was my first kind of tap into resilience was the public service kind of course. Um, and then university wise. And then I managed to have the opportunity to work in London during the Olympics um, with one of the London boroughs that touches on the park, mm -hmm. the park area where it's built. Um, so that was brilliant. Mm. That was great learning. You can't learn better than being in the thick of it at times. Yeah. Um, so I did that and then I come back, finished my degree. Um, and then, yeah, I've just, I've dabbled. You know, I worked for a football club for a while. Wow. Um, I did have my offers of different other things to do, but I wanted it to be quite focused. Mm -hmm. um, so I managed to make some connections through my research project at university. And uh, I just spoke to them and said, I really want to go into it, but I want to wait for the right position. And um, that's when I had the opportunity to volunteer with West Mids Police. Wow. Um, just while I was just, you know, searching where I wanted to work, what my next step was um, and there was an opening that happened there and so I went for it and I went for uh, other jobs as well okay I didn't want to um, cut my options off so I went for some other jobs and yeah I got it so great as well as some other things I had to make some tough decisions yeah about what I wanted to do um, yeah so I chose policing and I think one of the biggest decisions of about that decision for me why I knew it was the right choice was the volunteering beforehand that I did for eight months mm -hmm. part-time yeah um, gave me a really interesting insight okay. into the world of resilience and all aspects of it so um, yeah I, I knew I knew what the challenges were yeah there I knew um, the kind of career aspirations that it could afford mm -hmm. me working there and I knew where it could take me as well, and I, I didn't. It didn't escape me how unique the opportunity was. Okay, and I constantly reminded people of that when I was there as a volunteer. You know, yeah, um, how how it's it is considered quite aspirational for some people that would love to work. Yeah, quite front line, I think. Yeah, um, and, and usually for an, an area of resilience, and so. Um, Yes, nearly seven years later, <laughs> I'm still there and uh, I love it. Absolutely love it. And I think the the volunteering kind of gave you that taster for it. Yes. Do you think that's really important in truly understanding what industry you get into then to have a, have a trial at it if you can? Mm. Yeah, so I think the way to look at it is if we were to look at everybody's resilience job on a job description, mm -hmm. they would all be the same. Yeah what you're doing, what you're producing, the skills that you need, yeah. exactly the same. Okay, yeah, yeah. What right. differentiates it is the organisation, where that's going, and the culture that you're moving mm -hmm. into. Um, so it's really important for you to understand, you know, because when, and I remember it when I was at university, you were talking about where do you want to go, and you're just so desperate, you're like, anywhere, yeah. just take me anywhere, somebody take me, please, just give me a chance. <laughs> um, and then it's just easier to hop around. Yeah. And that, there is something in that, because you don't know what you don't like mm -hmm. if you haven't tried it. Very true. So um, there is a little bit in that, but also I think try everything and just see where it gets you. So I, I was really lucky that I, I did try working for a council for a bit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've tried the private sector for a little while, um, and I've tried um, frontline responding okay. organisation. Oh, wow. So the only thing I hadn't had an opportunity to, to have a have a go at was um, a humanitarian okay. organisation. So I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be sure as to how that would work for me, but um, I did enough to know and, and I have confidence in my decision at the time that, uh, yeah, this is the right choice for me, right career choice. So, yeah, volunteering massively shaped me as well as my previous um, work experience as well. I think that's, um, thank you for sharing that. And guys, I think if you're listening or watching, that's some really valuable advice, especially if you're starting out in your career or you're studying and you're not really sure, get out there and try and do some volunteering. I mean, what are you doing with your spare time? You might as well do something that might help you in your career. So that's really good advice. Mm. So thank you. Okay, so my next question to you is, we are obviously women in resilience, yeah. yeah? <laughs> and that, you know, comes with a whole host of challenges. And I'd 
be really interested to learn about what your challenges have been being um, a woman in this industry, especially where you work now, where it's mm-hmm. generally heavily male dominated. Mm-hmm. And just like looking back in your career, what what those challenges have been and how you've overcome them? Yeah. It's wow. It's, it's a huge <laughs> so, question. <yeah. laughs> Maybe some key, key ones. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so one of the challenges is about how do we get our message out there in resilience, mm-hmm. um, which is everybody's resilience challenge, I think. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. How do we how do we put that out there to an organization that, particularly for mine, mm-hmm. um, they're fast paced. Yeah. So they look it's at very, problems yeah. on a 24 hour basis and they've already moved on by you know, in mm-hmm. by the next 24 hours. Yeah. So wow. how do we get the organization to be more astute to longer term mm-hmm. problems, stuff that might hit over the next five years, because that's what we're talking about, yeah. National Risk Register and the organizational risk. How do you get them to be more mindful on top of their day job mm. that resilience is important and um, some of the options and stuff they need to think about is really unique. Yeah. Um, so getting the organization consciousness is is really is really key. Um, however, how have I overcome that? So I've, I've broke it down over the last um, seven years in my career to um, marginal gains in some things. Um, but some things are really simple. So okay. just to summarize, um, one of the key things was looking at the product that we deliver. So okay. the plans that we have, mm-hmm. I got rid of the book style plans. Okay. They are interactive. So oh. we have particular roles and that role might be their day-to-day role or it might be something they step into in, in terms of an instant role. Mm-hmm. Um, they just want to know what they need to know. So they can go in there, click into it. What's my role? Click into that. And if there's a theme behind that, that interlinks to the wider information. Right, okay. So they're not doing this because they've they've lost it by now. Yeah, so true. Because you've got to imagine, you know, they're there with their radios and they're recording their decisions. They're talking to other agencies. They haven't got time to be doing this. Um, and business continuity is very similar. Okay. Um, so the business continuity aspects of the resilience that we, we plan for, um, very simple guides, it's broken down by teams, um, and then it's broken down into um, buildings. Okay. And then there's an organisational wide one. Amazing. So it like it's a bit like a Russian cop, really. You know, it all kind of slots into one. Yeah. Um, so yeah, product development number one. Because if you don't, if you don't think it's going to work, and you yourself can't use it, you've lost that selling point straight away. Absolutely. And the other thing is as well, um, one of the tips that somebody gave me when I first started was. Always think about your audience. Okay. Always think about your audience. And I know that sounds so obvious, doesn't it? But yeah. we think about compliance quite a lot. Mm-hmm. We okay. think about compliance and we think about our, you know, our standards that we've got to got to meet. That actually success comes from the ability of the organisation to use what you've put out there. Um, so that then launched me into training. Okay. Um and the developing of people. So one of the biggest challenges for me was um, around the embedding is how do we get incidents which we hope never happen. We're always on the what if question and yeah. when. Um, when they're already dealing with complex crime, mm-hmm. complex policing challenges, how do I get them to think about resilience? Okay, yeah. And this is a workforce that moves around as well. Right, yeah. So every 12 months, you'll get new people in post. So wow. how do you keep that CPD up? Yeah. Um, that this is an area of importance and um, that's relevant to them mm-hmm. when we've got that constantly changing dynamic. And then, of course, our operating environment's constantly changing. Um, the way of policing, even two years ago, is different to what's expected now. And the way that cyber response is mm-hmm. now peaked is is different from it wasn't really spoke about five years ago. Yeah, absolutely for me. No, um, yeah. So so raising awareness and hitting the target audience is key. So um, investing in the people is another area that I've had to layer on in demand. Now it is it is demand. Yeah. On top of keeping up with the planning, on top of keeping up with the industry. So that's a big challenge for mm-hmm. me. Um, but 
we're getting there with it and it's starting, the buy-in's getting in there. Um, we're getting CPD events every year with all of our senior leaders. Okay. So we get everybody in there. Our chief Great. constable's in, involved and he really supports resilience. Um, yeah, I, I'm really lucky to have raised the resilience agenda continuously to say, this is important to you because, um, and don't undervalue the windows of opportunity after a national event to say, if that was us, that this would be tough for us. Yeah. Um, so that those little key buy-ins all the time. Um, so yeah, there's there's a message that we have to continuously embed all the time. It's not a one-time thing every mm -hmm. every year, annual review, 12-year review of a plan. No, it's continuous, Yeah. constant. Constantly talk about it, constantly email, constantly put events out, keeping that resonance there all the time. Um, and then I think, my other biggest area is some areas and challenges in resilience. So we know what we need to do, we know what we need to plan for, but sometimes it can be really, really difficult um, to plug gaps. Right. So nationally, we've seen a lot of learning from the Manchester attacks, mm -hmm. London Bridge attack yeah. and Grenfell Tower. And everybody's saying, what if that's us? Yeah. How would we perform? What would be difficult for us? Um, what would we get scrutinised on? And so what I'm trying to do is to raise the organisation's consciousness with that in mind. Okay, yeah. Um, use that as an opportunity. But let's be honest, this is going to feel tough for us. So I think there's something about leading with weaknesses. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Leading, with weaknesses. leading with weaknesses. So. Okay. It's not a failure to say that's going to be tough for us. It's not. Um, and I think we're all, we talk about stakeholder buying and mm -hmm. how do you tell people above you, this isn't going to feel great and have that honest conversation, yeah. you know. Um, you don't want to be that person. And my role as head of resilience is to be the critical friend to the organisation. And the way that I say that is I'm saying this because it needs to be said mm -hmm. and I would rather say it than have an inquiry where that individual is being held to account on that. So there's a way of there's uh, there's a way of being able to build trust mm -hmm. and being able to have those conversations, build a culture of open honesty. Yeah. This is what we're great at. Let's continue that. This is going to be really tough. Let's put a development plan behind this and let's start working away at it. Um, so, biggest events that have happened over the last few years for us, um, I am certainly going to be leading with that. Um, we can't do everything, no. but let's demonstrate what we're doing about it and, and say that to the public. Say, this is really tough. If it wasn't tough, we wouldn't be having inquiries. Um, numerous people wouldn't be lo losing their lives. Numerous effects on the economy and finance, the local area. You know, it, it's never ending for these these mm -hmm. areas of resilience that we're talking about. Let alone the organisational impact. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, that's that's another area that I would I would absolutely say is a big challenge. Honesty, trust, but lead with weaknesses because there's nothing better than an organisation just being a little bit more aware about where where it needs to go. Yeah. I yeah. love that. Lead with weaknesses. What an interesting take on it. Yeah. Very different to what we've heard um, from our real model in the resilience industry. So that is something to take yeah, note of. Well. That's fine. What about, um, so you, you've kind of talked about um, the challenges mm. for the, the, the sector that you're in and it's, it's huge and there's probably many more that you could you could talk about but what about personal challenges to you in you know in your career so far what has what has been some key you know key ones that you'd like to share with us so my I think one of the first things that um, I didn't really pay attention to at the time it's only a contemplating <laughs> <laughs> um, having a look back on it is I was 22 when I came into management okay so it's very, very young. young yeah yeah it's very young and um, with that I wasn't naive to, to suggest I had all the answers mm -hmm. at all um, and I knew that the job at, at hand was a really tough role to um, it's a tough industry let alone yes, the role yeah. um, and then there's understanding policing and the way it works um, 
there's what you think happens and then there's actually how it happens. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's adjusting to that whole culture. So personally, I think um, stepping into resilience at um, that managerial level has been the best thing that could happen to me. Right, okay. Um, because you have no time to think about what, what could happen if that was my problem or mm-hmm. could I could I do that job, can I not, can I face that problem? You're doing it. Yeah. You're doing it day to day and um, my, my little tip for myself has been that I, I just gathered people that have been in there a long time and, you know, spoke to them this is really tough for me, what about you? And they'll say, curse, that's tough for anybody in the job. So there's a little bit about continuous development and growth mindset that I've really, really embedded in, in, in my kind of personal development. Love that, yeah. Yeah, and even now, when I made Head of Resilience at um, 28, which is still quite young, mm-hmm. um, which is amazing. And, and I, like I say, I try not to think about it, um, but yeah it's there and i'm mindful of it and i I just have to pinch myself about how much i've learned and Mm -hmm. and how much i'm progressing all the time um but so so yeah my personal development journey has been huge and i read a lot i have coaches i have mentors i have development goals um i'm openly reflective Mm -hmm. um i'm really i'm really passionate to make sure that um i write down what i've achieved Mm -hmm. And just be grateful to myself for that, yeah. you know, because you can lose perspective at times yeah. about, well, this job's tough, but actually over the last few months, look what you've done. Um, so that's that's been a that's been a little bit of a personal growth for me mm-hmm. is um, the job's going to be never ending. Yeah, and it's the a industry challenge. is. Yeah. So yeah, get, gather that strength. It's really interesting because self-reflection is always good. Um, just going back on the point you made about being quite young and then going mm. into a management position and now being still very young and doing head of resilience. Mm. How has that affected kind of your team? Because you're, you're responsible for quite a number of people mm. directly or indirectly. Mm. Have they ever seen you as, oh no, you're so young. What do you, what do you know? Have you ever had that kind of attitude towards you? And if so, how have you dealt with that? Yeah, so um, thankfully in operations, there's a there's a healthy split between female and male gendered roles. Okay. Yeah, in the senior leadership team. Okay, great. In operations itself, which houses firearms, the dogs teams, the search teams, mm. the drones team, the airport, so for travel, and of course resilience events planning, they attract a certain type of individual. Mm-hmm. Um, and that naturally will mean that it kind of tips towards the male gender type. Um, We're working on that Mm. because we want to make sure that people know that you can go into these careers, you know, um, and making sure the roles are flexible as much as possible um, and consider people's needs. So I never really carried a a bit of a a barrier around gender. Okay. In that sense. Yeah, okay. Um, Did I get people that looked at me and said, who are you? Who are you to tell me? And um, I don't know who you are. Mm-hmm. You know, yes. Okay. Because it's a it's a very rank orientated organisation. Yeah. But that's not just in policing. I'm very aware mm-hmm. that, um, that you know, in the public sector, for instance, it's about what grade you're at. Yes. You know, and your title. If you're very if you haven't true. got senior in your title, if you haven't got manager in your title. Mm-hmm. If you haven't got director, assistant, you know, they have all of these barriers to people. Yeah, they do, yeah. Um, I don't see those barriers. <laughs> it's one of the qualities that my colleagues say about me is that um, Kirsty doesn't see barriers. I'm aware of them. Though. Yeah. I'm aware of them and um, I consciously move around them. I know when I can push a barrier and when I can't. Okay. Um, I have had people um, look at me in a bit of a queer way as if to say, who are you? Mm-hmm. What do you want? And um, speak to my PA, yeah. you know? Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, that, that gets that gets <laughs> less and less. Okay, good, yeah. yeah. So the more you push, the more you push, uh, this is me, and I think may, remaining integral to yourself. Yeah. Um, it's not just my challenge. Officers get it, in particular, if they're of a certain rank and they want to speak to another level, they'll okay. say, I'm only speaking to such a level. Um, 
or an officer might chair a meeting and the, the partners that attend would reflect and say they're not senior enough to chair that meeting. Oh wow, okay. So this, yeah. these barriers aren't just mine and that really helped me okay. in terms of perspective. Wow. Because you can, you can think to yourself, oh, it's just me. <laughs> You know, it's, why is it? Why is it mm. me? And mm -hmm. and um, is there something about me that makes me stand out? And all of those things yeah. that people naturally, you know, perspective is no barriers are there. It's just that yours are yours, and others um, could be yours or or different. So that helped me a lot. Mm. Perspective. I love that. It's really good advice for those of you who are watching and listening because it, everything you've said yeah. um, is relevant across all different industries. Mm. And you are sitting there nodding. I know I can see you guys nodding or listening. And you're like, yes, yes, I did. That's the perspective. Love this key takeaway from that. So thank yeah. you. It's a really, um, it just opened my eyes up to actually look at it that way. So mm. thank you. Um, I've got one other thing that I'd like to yeah. say as well. Um, so I think one of the other biggest challenges is, and we're going to see more of this, this is mm -hmm. more of a future reflection as well, a little bit, Yeah. Um, is resilience is one of those areas of business that so few people will be responsible for it, but it relies on a lot of other people to, um, to do it. Mm -hmm. So how do you... Um, how do you gain the support of the wider organisation and the people economy side of things? Um, and I call it the grey area of resilience. Okay. So there are so many grey areas where there's a task at hand. I'm not responsible for mm -hmm. it. Neither are you. But our senior leaders believe between us, something has to be done about yeah. it. It's so critical, right? Yeah. Um, so how do you get them people that aren't, accountable to you uh -huh. don't have performance targets against any of this um to get that buy-in uh -huh. you know so the gray areas of delivery is so important for resilience um and that influence that you have to do that influence and beyond the role uh -huh. and that's really where leadership comes into it with resilience so um just, I love that and touching on those gray areas of resilience if you what what can you do then to, to manage that. So if there's a piece of work and it's no one's responsibility, do you, mm. would you take that on board and then try and be the facilitator in the middle to drive it forward? So I think a lot of, um, I think a lot of newbies to the industry would, would grip it and just get it done and then mm -hmm. do it themselves. I think when you're a bit more seasoned in resilience, yeah. um, you realize that the quick win isn't the best outcome for the whole organization. Okay. Um, so, Actually, by getting everybody together, yeah, and and it needs to be the right level, okay, and put in a delivery plan in place. And I typically, um, I genuinely say this is nobody's business. Okay, let's put it out there. Let's let's tell everybody this isn't my job. This isn't your job. But the public would expect this of us. Mm -hmm. Your organisation would expect it of us. Your stakeholders would absolutely expect this. And and we all know our gaps when I say this, you okay, know, we, yeah. we all know what we're talking about yeah. in terms of our organisational gaps and, and mm -hmm. the grey areas. Yeah. Um, some of them are really critical. Others um, are ticking time bombs. So um, I think the buy in and just have it out there and say this is nobody's direct issue. And we can focus so much on that mm -hmm. by saying this ownership is one area and this is this one department. Yeah. No, so many areas of resilience are interconnected. Absolutely. It's that interconnection um, that delivery really mm -hmm. is is quite challenging, but it's the, I, I think it's the, it's the sweet spot of resilience for delivery. And uh, the, the only name I can call it is collaboration. Mm -hmm. It's collaborative, mm -hmm. it's collaborative working. Um, and for my job, um, because I cover emergency planning and business continuity, yeah. it's internal and external. Yep. And it's very different. Mm -hmm. It's very different skills. Uh, because, of course, partners are governed by their own organisations. And there is a layer of uh, legislation over the top of that. But ultimately, legislation doesn't set specific deliverables. Mm -hmm. So that delivery then, this isn't mine, it's not yours. How do we do that? 
um, yeah, it's it, that's that's a big challenge. And when you are a woman, mm -hmm. when you don't lead these people yourself, so yeah. you're not you're not their manager. Yeah. Um, how do you influence that? And that's where the trust, the engagement, the humanity in your leadership by saying, this is really tough, this is why this needs to be done, mm -hmm. really comes out. Mm. Thank you, that's really, really insightful and some good tips mm. for our viewers and listeners to take away. So if you are, if you listen to this and watch this and you do implement, start implementing this and have shifted in the mindset, then drop us a note. Yeah. So you've got, a, another personal challenge that you'd like to share with with all of us too that you felt yeah. was quite important yeah, yeah so um over over the last couple of years um particularly when when you step into management i think when there's less doing and there's more of um reporting mm -hmm. and doing more you know communications particularly written and presenting information, mm -hmm. really trying to get people to buy into what you're saying. Um, there's been some discussions about potentially me being dyslexic. Mm -hmm. And then um, last year in 2019, I was diagnosed with dyslexia. Okay. Um, and for me, when I had my diagnosis, it was a case of, um, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, that okay. makes sense. Um, so, Dyslexia is very individual. Okay. Um, very individual. It's very different mm -hmm. as well. It, it sounds like it's the same thing, but it's not. It's it's really not. Um, so yeah, uh, I have what people call Kirsty language. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, and I, I didn't really understand what they meant from that, but now I get it. Okay. Now I get it. So um, I have quite an, an unusual way of communicating to people and um, reporting up mm -hmm. um, and my style. Um, so my dyslexia diagnosis enabled me to just tap into that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And so I, I basically, I think in pictures. Okay. I think in pictures, uh, I think big mm -hmm. as well. Um, so it's, it's no wonder then that I'm able to take an area like resilience, see all of the complex interconnected yeah. issues and get some clarity from that chaos. I can see patterns quite easy. I can na navigate challenges. Um, and my personal um, style, be it the way it is, makes me think long term. So I think quite strategically, naturally, yeah, okay. you know, in that way. Um, so then when I'm talking, sometimes I'll be going off at all sorts of tangents and the person in front of you like, can you just get to the point? <laughs> um, so there's lots that, there's lots that I've learned around how, how do I, that, okay, that's my style, but yeah. that's not everybody else's. Okay. How do I translate what works for me, what works for that person mm -hmm. into a, a mode? So that's been my personal challenge um, over last year is adapting to that. Okay. Um, and there's so many things that have enabled my dyslexia to, um, not affect me as much. Okay. Um, so I, I've i used tinted kind of um, visual displays. So oh, I, okay. what works for me is an orange tint. Okay. It's very, very individual. Sometimes blue, purple, greens work for others. Um, and then I use grid paper because okay. I don't think in terms of lines. Okay. You know, it's structured in that way. Um, so I'll use a lot of visual mm -hmm. information. I'll do a lot of mind maps. Um, yeah, so it's been a journey. It's been wow. a real big journey. And um, I'm happy to share that more and more moving forward to inspire other people about, you know, these barriers, these personal barriers mm -hmm. um, that people have to overcome in resilience and um, doing their job. You know, yeah. how can we maximise people coming to work and giving their best effort? Um, so yeah, dyslexia, whoever thought it. And I mean, thank you for sharing that because it's quite yeah. personal and, yeah. and you know, it's, it's, it's really, I really do appreciate you coming uh, and being so open and honest about it to everyone and also sharing kind of things that help you because that's practical. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting that after so long, you kind of found this out so mm. it's it's interesting and if anybody wants to um share their tips on how they manage that in their workplace then do share because that's what 
this show is all about. Um, I, I do like the, I do find your, like the, uh, the coloured tints quite interesting. Mm. Um, like what, what does, what does that do for, like for me, like I, that doesn't make a difference for me, but how does that make a difference for you? So the whole point of having tints is that, um, and the orange does this for me, it takes the visual stress out of the page. Okay. So I tried it yesterday actually with a colleague um, where I was talking about, because I have a, an orange book as well, okay. an orange writing book, um, who commented, because it, it, you can see it, mm. you know, and people say, oh, What's well, yeah, what are those for? My orange glasses and, and my book and whatever else. And um, he goes, oh, well, just try it. Mm. So I, I got him to put my glasses on. He goes, yeah. So the white on black for me is too stressful for my okay. eyes. Um, but the orange takes that stress out. Okay, so it. advice for your fellow resilience professionals slash any newbies um, in the industry. Okay, so um, I think the first one is that it's a tough industry. Mm -hmm. So people, people wonder um, what it's like to get into it, how can they get into it. Mm -hmm. So my number one tip is to just get involved and you don't necessarily need to have a full-time job in resilience to get involved in it. Okay. So you could be involved in another department and you could have a incident management role. Yeah. A response function. Mm -hmm. um, have a try at it, see if yeah. you like it. There's so many volunteering opportunities. You could take on projects, get involved, and see if it's for you. Mm -hmm. um, exercises are a great thing to get involved okay. in. You know, I, I'm always appealing to students and members of the public and um, you know our partners to get involved in exercising and, and feel what mm -hmm. it's like to, to go through a disaster. Um, from a perspective of the public and give us some feedback on it, you know, uh, and then and then say, could you plan and work in mm -hmm. something like this, you know, and could you be on the on the capability side of the organisation, preparing the organisation for this, you know. Um, so volunteering is a massive thing that I'll mm -hmm. always push. And I say volunteer, it doesn't need to be full time. Okay. You could be doing a job already and get involved. Yeah. Or you could be a student and have a summer period where you could have a, a summer placement mm -hmm. or just ask for a tour of somebody's office. Wow. Just get speaking to people in the industry. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and one of the biggest things that I really liked, College of Policing started, was uh, Copper Connections, mm. which is where they randomly match you and you um, speak to each other over email. Oh, okay. And then if you want to, you can then go over the phone and mm. have a chat or meet up. Um, let's do that in the resilience yeah. community. Build your network. Um, speak to people. What's it like working in your area? And what people love to talk. <laughs> people love it. Um, you know, I like it. Yeah. You know, when people ask. So yeah, that'd be my number one: is is mm -hmm. volunteering, get an insight, and you, you could be working full time or not, and it just expands your kind of perceptions and the realities of the job a little bit yeah. more. I think. Yeah. Um, I also think. Some people ask me, how have I been able to get into the position that I've got mm -hmm. to so fast? Yeah. Now, a little bit of that, and I'm not naive to thinking this, is you're limited by what opportunities are around you, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So um, people aren't always fortunate to have an organisation that supports your development, um, that can see your strengths and what you're good at and will mm -hmm. push your career. That's not for everyone. So my biggest tip is you have to invest in yourself. Mm -hmm. Number one, don't rely on your manager. Mm -hmm. Don't rely on that development plan. You are your number one goal yeah. and you're not limited to the job you're in. Okay, yeah. So one thing I always say to people, yeah. do, do your next job now and demonstrate to yourself that you've got what it takes. Mm -hmm. Do you know, I read a fact the other day um, that when it comes to promotions and moving up, um, a potential barrier is that 80% of women will not apply for a job if they haven't got the skills or they don't perceive themselves to have the skills mm. to do it. And yet, 80% of men will. Yeah. So there's something about preparing your mindset yeah, and mm -hmm. and doing that to, to consciously assure yourself you are ready for that job, mm -hmm. you know. 
Um, so I always think do the next level job before you're in it and it convinces yourself that you are absolutely the right person for it. it takes away any barriers of imposter syndrome mm -hmm. or I don't fully have all the skills to do the job. I don't have the experience to do the job. Yeah. Um, people have experience of of all sorts of things that are transferable. Mm -hmm. um, and it's one thing that enabled me to get into my industry. Really sell your transferable areas. Okay, so um, my favorite question <laughs> to ask everyone, and you guys will know this by now, is what is your current favorite book, Kirsty? Oh, this was really hard. <laughs> this is so hard. I do so much reading. So I pinned it down to two of okay. my favorites okay so these have shaped my thinking over the last 12 months okay. um my first book that i want to introduce um is about people so this one is called surrounded by idiots um it's a title that sounds quite negative <laughs> <laughs> and who, who's it by thomas, thomas erickson okay so this book is um about it says here i don't know if you can see it but it says four types of human behavior and it says how to understand those around us who cannot be understood, right? <laughs> so this. this is about how do we get our agenda across when okay. we've, everybody's got a different style of working mm -hmm. or what's important to them. Um, so he mainly talks in colours, red, the, the fiery red, the oh. sunshine yellow person, the earthy green and the mm -hmm. cool blue. Um, and it's a model that... Um, I use all the time mm -hmm. and I bet if people look through this they'll be able to look at the fiery red and people will mm -hmm. come to mind you know or certain situations will trigger people to be fiery red or whatever mm -hmm. um, so this one helped me communicate better and um, those barriers of why am I just not getting it with people mm -hmm. I saw it from a different perspective here fabulous and your second favorite book so my second favourite book um, has been more of a personal one mm -hmm. from the last 12 months. Okay. Um, and this one is Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life. And his 12 rules um, enabled me to have a different perspective on myself. Okay. Um, so as an example, uh, one of the rules is about treating yourself like someone you are responsible for helping. And that's mm. rule two. So, you know, and as an example, it's where I think sometimes, and I am totally guilty of this and as, as a leader, I give so much to other people mm -hmm. because they're, they're really important to me. Make sure they're happy at work, make sure they're supported, yeah. make sure that the work is, is manageable, doable, what challenges are coming up, all that. And yet when it comes to yourself, you have different rules for yourself yeah. about, you know, so why is it that we give so much to others and, and have a second level to ourselves? Mm -hmm. We all know about mindfulness and why yeah. is that needed? So the perspective of treat yourself as you would a friend. Yeah. What would I tell a friend? What mm -hmm. would I tell a colleague? Um, and so it, yeah, it's almost talking to yourself. Yeah. <laughs> have a word with yourself. Mm -hmm. um, Take your own advice yeah and there are many other lessons in there that really resonated with me um that i think just allow your leadership to just be that that one step further mm, fantastic so remind our viewers and listeners of your two favorite books again so we've got surrounded by idiots by thomas erickson and we've got 12 rules for life by jordan peterson Fantastic. Thank you for sharing. And guys, if you've read any of these books, um, let me know, let Kirsty know and share your opinions because that's what it's all about. So another few great books to go on well, the reading. Coming to an end now, unfortunately, we've had such amazing insights from the wonderful Kirsty, and I literally could just spend the whole day asking her loads of questions, but we have to let her go <laughs> at some point, not her held, hold her hostage in the Resilience Pod. Um, but before we go, um, where can the Resilience Pod viewers and listeners and readers find you? So, I'm accessible completely on LinkedIn. Okay. That's probably the best route. Okay. Um, some of the readers, watchers, and listeners might be able to um, access Resilience Direct, which is okay. a public sector, um, in the main, public sector resilience tool. Mm -hmm. um, my details are on there as well. But yeah, absolutely LinkedIn. Okay. Um, so if anybody's got anything that they'd like to ask or want me to explain a little bit more or, mm -hmm. you know, 
or even just a chat mm-hmm. about you know some of that we spoke about happy to do that so mm. that's the best portal thank you. thank you that's really kind and so guys if you want to know more then contact Kirsty on linkedin and i will link everything below Time. we are officially at the end now and at the start um, Kirsty looked through the mood book and she said that she was feeling contemplative now she's having a look now and how is she feeling after the interview oh i've chosen quite an oh, extravagant she's, she's, one she's chosen already that's great <laughs> so, show us oh <laughs> and tell us tell the audience what that is so this is, is this is the rocking, rocking. mood <laughs> Uh, and I chose that one because doesn't it feel great in being able to impart some of your experience and challenges onto mm-hmm. other people? Mm-hmm. Um, I love that. So I feel quite positive in being able to hopefully being able to inspire or help or, you know, even just to get some of my experiences that can resonate with others. So, mm-hmm. yeah. I'm feeling rocking. Thank you. <laughs> um, I am sure you all agree that she has definitely done that. It's been great insight into learning about kind of some of the insides into policing, but also more importantly, because it's not just about policing, it's about your personal journey too. And that is mm. really what the Resilience Pod is about, and masking the real models in the resilience yeah. industry and their real challenges. So thank you so much for very coming on today so grateful it's been amazing and hopefully to see you again soon absolutely thank you <laughs> right guys thank you so much for tuning in today whether you have been listening or watching us thank you so much uh, don't forget to subscribe to the resilience pod uh, we're on youtube spotify um, and visit the blog Um, See you all next time and don't forget to stay tuned. Bye for now.